operation on the mandibular molar, you will require the armamentarium that you see here in front of you. You will need a perioprobe, a sharp explorer, a mirror, your deniform screwdriver, a sharp pencil, and of course the equilibrated dentec with centric stops evenly distributed throughout the arch. Make sure that your complete assortment of diamonds is available and also the carbides should be displayed at this time. The step-by-step -step model will be used in conjunction with the step-by-step -step handout in your syllabus. The first step is the placement of depth grooves or guiding grooves in the occlusal surface. These grooves will be placed in all of the fissures and at the crest of the triangular ridges. Remember that the depth grooves on the non-functional cusps will have to be approximately one millimeter in depth, whereas the depth grooves on the functional or buccal cusp, remember this is a mandibular molar, so the buccal cusp is the functional cusp, have to be approximately one and a half millimeter in depth. After these initial guiding grooves have been placed, we can proceed with half of the occlusal reduction, retaining the distal half as a reference. Note that a functional cusp bevel extends over the functional cusp, which again results in an approximate reduction of 1.5 millimeters. After the occlusal reduction has been completed, we will then proceed with the actual reduction of the tooth. Again, half a tooth at a time, maintaining the other half for reference. Once satisfied with this half of the actual reduction, the tooth preparation is then completed and finished, which includes smoothing of all surfaces, delineation of the chamfer margin, and rounding of all pertinent line angles. Initially, it may be easier to place some depth holes in the occlusal surface. Typically, these are placed in the central pit and are roughly one millimeter deep. Then one is placed in the mesial fossa and the distal fossa. Once placed, these depth holes, after their depth of approximately one millimeter has been verified, can be connected by making a horizontal cut following the normal anatomy of the occlusal surface. This cut can then be extended into the marginal ridge areas and this cut will serve as a guide for the placement of the other grooves. The lingual depth grooves are placed next. At this time, it can be very helpful to be thoroughly familiar with the actual measurements of the rotary instrument. After the grooves have been placed in the respective fissures, place one depth cut at the crest of each of the two lingual triangular ridges. Once completed, these grooves should be approximately one millimeter in depth. At this stage, the orientation of the carbide is changed and the same type of depth grooves are placed on the lingual facing inclines of the buccal functional cut. Recall that these grooves have to be slightly deeper, approximately a millimeter and a half will suffice. When working in close proximity to adjacent teeth, you should exercise some caution so as not 
to damage them iatrogenically. Here, the occlusal aspect of the depth cuts has been completed. Now, the buccal depth cuts will be extended over the crest of the buccal cusp and will serve to place the so-called functional cusp bevel. These depth cuts will be approximately 1.5 millimeters near the crest of the cuspal ridge, but will fade into the existing buccal surface. Note that a portion of the carbide remains visible beyond the surface which is being cut. The primary area of reduction is at the cusp tip only. This then completes the placement of the depth cuts for occlusal reduction. You can use your perioprobe to verify the depth of these grooves, approximately a millimeter in all of the lingual grooves and approximately one millimeter and a half on the buccal aspect. Note once again that as the probe is placed in the buckle facing grooves, these grooves fade out towards the cervical. The half DT diamond can then be used to remove the islands of tooth structure between the grooves. Remember that first only the mesial half of the occlusal reduction will be completed and reduce only one island at a time so as to maintain the semblance of the normal occlusal configuration. The depth grooves, of course, serve to standardize the amount of tooth reduction. It is critical that the orientation of the rotary instrument is adjusted for each individual component of the reduction. In the area of the marginal ridge, it may be somewhat tricky and it may be desirable to leave a very small amount of tooth structure immediately in the area of the contact point. The completed reduction, however, should allow for at least one millimeter clearance by comparison to the adjacent marginal ridge. The buckle cusp is reduced in a similar manner. The functional cusp bevel is placed next. Again, note the orientation of the diamond relative to the remaining intact tooth structure. At this time, assess the remaining tooth structure and the adequacy of your occlusal reduction. If a small proximal contact is present, usually the entire occlusal reduction can be completed 
without any risk of damage to the adjacent tooth. If, however, a broad contact is present, as is the case here, it may be desirable to maintain this tiny lip of tooth structure. This will be removed during one of the later steps as a pass is made with the rotary instrument through the interproximal area. Note that in the area of the centric stop, approximately 1.5 millimeters of clearance or occlusal reduction has been obtained. On the lingual aspect, note that the reduction is approximately one millimeter. Once satisfied with the dimensional requirements, the occlusal reduction on the distal half of the occlusal surface can be completed. Again, adjust the orientation of the rotary instrument for each step of this procedure. Sometimes, time can be saved by switching from the lingual reduction immediately to the placement of the functional cusp bevel on the buccal surface, since essentially the same orientation of the rotary instrument is used. Initially, you may find it easier, however, to tackle each component individually since less of the guide groove remains to reduce this distolingual cut. Excuse me, distal buckle cut, of course. Upon completion of the occlusal reduction, the basic anatomy of the occlusal configuration should remain. A strip of boxing wax can be used to verify the actual occlusal clearance. Removal of the strip will show indentations on the opposing occlusal surface as well as indentations made by the actual occlusal reduction. You can use your thickness gauge to verify the actual amount of clearance which you have obtained. Remember again that it should be one millimeter on the non-functional and 1.5 millimeters on the functional cusps. Th the next step is placement of the lingual guiding grooves. Remember that the alignment of the diamond should be parallel to the long axis in a mesiodistal direction. And when viewing along the side of the arch, recall that there is approximately a nine degree lingual inclination to the orientation of the diamond. Once satisfied, that in both directions, the orientation of the rotary instrument is pro appropriate, place the lingual guiding grooves in the center of the lingual surface and both mesial and distal line angle area. Do not sink the diamond all the way into the tooth and leave the tip of the cutting instrument approximately a millimeter occlusal to the crest of the gingival tissues. When completed, this is what the lingual depth cuts should look like. This same procedure is then repeated on the buccal surface. It may be somewhat difficult the first time to transfer the alignment of the instrument 